As George Floyd said, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Me o le mi ma. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Ni a laugh and a rule. Dwin messi and a clue. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. La yum ke nuni tana fos. Yo non posso respirar. Oi sas na hule para. Je ne peux pas respirer. Je ne peux pas respirer. Ich kann nicht atmen. Je ne peux pas respirer. 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 I would like to thank the choir for the wonderful rendition of Lift Up Your Voice and Sing and welcome you both in the congregation and those watching and listening at home to this service marking the first anniversary of the murder of George Floyd. 
The tragic events of a year ago today shocked the world. They resulted in mass protests in George Floyd's native USA, here in Britain and Ireland, and across most of the globe. It brought into sharp focus the issues of racial violence and intolerance, which were encapsulated by the cry of Black Lives Matter that was heard during many of the protests for justice and equity. In this country, we know that sadly, black people in particular have died whilst, whilst in police custody. We also know that others have died as a result of racist violence and that racism remains a significant issue in our society. As a result of George Floyd's murder and the clamor for greater racial justice, churches of all traditions and denominations in Britain and Ireland call this a Kairos moment, a moment of decision and action. Many committed themselves to the task of becoming more equitable and justice driven. This service is an opportunity to not only remember George Floyd, but to recognize that the work for justice and equity continues. The Christian scriptures speak of a God who loves justice and stands alongside those who pursue it. God's son, the Lord Jesus Christ, stood alongside those who were the victims of injustice and spoke against those who used their power in unjust ways. So today, we come before God recognizing the need to stand up for racial justice and to stand against intolerance. This service will therefore enable us to remember George Floyd, but also encourage us to become change makers. We will hear and see how we can do this through scriptures, music, poetry, prose, and action. I would like to invite our four speakers, the Reverend John Perambalat, the Bishop of Bradwell, University student Gabriel D.G., the Venerable Rosling Malek, Archdeacon of Croydon, and youth worker Dion Marie White to provide reflections on how they respond, how they responded to the murder of George Floyd. no longer the same. From the moment of his painful death, I knew things could no longer be the same. I thought of he, George Floyd, who died a terrible racist and deliberately emasculating death, like too many other fathers, brothers, sons. He is no longer, and his last brief words have become our rallying cry. I am no longer the same. At that moment, part of me also died on that road, the part that shares my indelible and much-loved skin color and African heritage, deliberately disempowered. I too was pinned on that street, and I will use all my breath to call out racial injustice, telling out that black lives do matter. We must no longer be the same. We all need to stop waiting for justice to roll down. And as churches join with others, proclaiming that now is the time for change. And to not only say it, but actively stand up and speak out. And not to stop doing until we see changes, the changes that need to happen, happen. Things are no longer the same. I hate violence, and this is not a bold political statement. This is not a comment about the state of the world, and that I can get to in a second. But I do hate violence, and I say that as someone who is still practically a child and who feels uncomfortable any time that I see symbols of brutality anywhere. As a result, George Floyd's death was hard for me. I did not want to see the video of the police officer kneeling on his neck and I did not want to be burdened with the trauma that would come of seeing that. So I found myself running. Constantly, I fled rooms whenever the news was on. I threw my phone away whenever images of his death would appear on my social media feed. And I shut myself away to flee conversations on the incident. We were once again being faced with the sight of death at the hands of oppression 
and I did not want to deal with it. However, there was a moment when I felt that I reached the breaking point. I can't breathe were his last words. See, this moment struck me because I remembered those words. I was only 12 when Eric Garner had died, and then too, I had felt like I had to run away from seeing a horrible death, death at the hands of oppression. I can only imagine the hurt that both the families of George Floyd and Eric Garner had to face in not only seeing their loved one die slowly and painfully, but to see brutality repeat itself again, despite centuries of constant defiance and protests appealing for societal change. One can only assume that there is a flaw in the system. Um, I'm a published author. Um, my book, The Escape, A Tale of Change and Revolution, I'm holding it right now. And at this moment, I feel like the main character in my published novel, Lamel Brathwaite, who went invited to speak at a change makers event, um, decides to talk about change, but changes his mind at the last moment. Despite the fact that he still talks about change, he didn't talk about personal changes he had planned. He speaks about wide scale change, systemic change. I would be ashamed of myself if I did not use this moment to do the same. We should never detract from the individual responsibility pinned against George Floyd's murderer. Yet those words, I can't breathe, speak to a much grander issues of the injustices that suffocate black people globally. Many black people feel that they cannot breathe when it comes to workplaces, education and healthcare amongst other problems. And very often our cries to make changes that cater to our well-being are left ignored or insufficiently addressed. In the wake of the recent waves of protests and activism, many organizations and industries have begun to listen and make actions towards being more attentive to black people. I urge all these organizations and industries to continue and to be careful that they are not doing so only for performance sake, but for the sake of a better, more inclusive world. There are black families and black individuals who are suffering the stress of injustice globally. And these changes that I speak of are necessary for them. Racism and injustice will not cease to exist today or tomorrow. George Floyd and all others who have been killed by police brutality could not be brought back from the dead. But we can do our part in making sure that no more are lost for these reasons. We can make sure that we try to help black people and all others who are suffering from oppression to feel able to breathe once again. And we can make sure that black lives are treated as if they matter. Things can no longer be the same. I'll just end this reflection with a quote from my book. We must revolt without ceasing. Never stop believing in the cause. Black lives do matter. Sad, angry, frustrated, grieving, and numb. I sat in my living room staring at the television, and then I cried. I felt so deeply about the legacies of racism, discrimination, and systemic oppression all over the world. I had seen them around me in this country, and I had seen them way back in India, where I grew up. Then I asked, where is God in all this? We were still in the Easter season and had just celebrated the Feast of Ascension. But I realized that Good Friday was not a thing of the past. We crucify God again and again. I also found God moving among us. When people of all colors came out into the street declaring that we care. When churches, universities, and other institutions began to ask serious questions about the institutional racism in a way they never did before. Yet, I felt sad that we needed to wait until another horrible death to get there. And I was troubled by some questions. Will our anger and frustration 
be channeled into tangible steps towards justice and fairness for all? Or will we continue to crucify God in the way we treat one another? Love is a matter of choice. Will we remain the same? As a youth leader and mentor, the murder of George Floyd sent a wave of sadness, fear, imposter syndrome, and mistrust to those I worked closely with on a daily basis. It broke my heart to see the changes that had occurred. Yet, I knew more than ever, I needed to be a listening ear, a shoulder to cry on, a hand to hold, and their biggest cheerleader. All the while, fighting an internal struggle of my own. As a mixed heritage young woman who identifies as black, a strong 98% of the time, that 2% made me feel very unsettled. For the first time in 26 years, I questioned if I had a place or a voice to speak up against the injustice. Would I be called out by the 2% who actually acknowledged my Caucasian roots? Would I be seen as the angry black woman by my Caucasian counterparts? All these questions as if I hadn't been deeply affected by racial abuse growing up. So why did their opinions matter? Why did I suddenly feel like I had to choose a side? I always understood it was never black versus white or us versus them, but simply wrong versus right, just versus unjust. So despite the discomfort and the uncertainty, I remembered that first and foremost, I am a child of God. So whose side was I leaning on? I was leaning on the Lord's side. I was on the side of our Heavenly Father, a God of justice, a God who has called me to lead and to mentor people, many of whom are black. And if they feel like they can't breathe, then it is my role to hold their hands and allow them to inhale and exhale, to remind them that their life is full of purpose and their existence always matters. It mattered before they were born. It mattered last year. It mattered last month. It mattered last week. It mattered yesterday. It matters today and it will matter for all eternity. I chose to inhale and exhale with them, knowing that we are in this fight for, it, for justice together. Even though things are no longer the same, we shall overcome in Jesus' name. No longer the same, the death of a black man which became a catalyst for change. The words I can't breathe etched in our memories as the heartbreaking wake up call. No longer the same, we shall remember his name. George Perry Floyd Jr. And now, let us all stand together as the choir leads us in what promises to be a rousing rendition of On Christ the Solid Rock I Stand.
Hi, I'm Matthew Shimalo. 25 years ago, I set out to answer a very major question. What is wrong with being black? And in answering this question, I had to come up with very strong questions, very powerful questions, which we as black people needed to confront ourselves with. What is responsible for these 2000 years of black backwardness? Why do we seem to fail even where we are in the majority? Is the black man victimized? Is the black man a victim of his own circumstances, pathologies of other people's opinions and decisions about him? Have blacks always been this way? If blacks are not cursed, what did they do to deserve almost 2,000 years of oppression, lack, etc., etc.? What is responsible for Africa being the richest continent when it comes to mineral resources and yet inhabited by the poorest persons or people? If black means only one sixteenth of the skin, why are blacks unable to overcome the victimities or pressure which comes with being black? Is there a conspiracy globally to keep black people at the bottom? Why do black nations constitute the biggest borrower nations? If blacks are not cursed, is their land cursed? I went on further and asked a lot more questions. Africans are religious by nature. Blacks are religious by nature. And where they have become Christians, they are committed. But why are there still no great progress to be seen? Why is there such a gap between white dominated and black dominated nations. I ask for other questions. What are the pathologies responsible for the state of blacks in different settings? Because if you go to the United States of America, Australia, South Africa, Europe, they seem to be at the bottom of the ladder. Can there be healings to the atrocities committed against blacks in the past? These were some of the questions and some more. What is the future of the black person? What is the black person confronted with the issues he is facing? Some African nations have the highest number of educated citizens. Yet, Africa in modern times have not really contributed significantly to the discoveries or in inventions which we see around us. If there is a future, what is the key to that future? When will the black man's day of manifestation come? These are some of the questions I raised when I was trying to answer the question, what is wrong with being black? And because of the brevity of the time, there is no time for me to take you through my research and the things I had to come up with. I had to make reference to about 4,000 sources. I must tell you, the black person have faced challenges no other race have ever faced. No people have been, ever been sold all over the world like the black person. 14 million into Europe and the far west into the Caribbeans. Much more than that into the Arabian lands. Only that the ones who were sold into Arabian lands did not survive because of the harshness of the treatment and the fact that they had to go through deserts, walking a thousand miles as slaves to get to be sold in the slave markets of Baghdad, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, etc., etc. But today I decided, instead of me just sharing with you the pathologies, the challenges of the black person, there's absolutely nothing wrong with the black person. 
let us face this fact if we want to see a turnaround in our community in our society follow me as i share some things i believe need to be in place number one we must own our own narratives we must not wait for the western press the press that doesn't belong to us to share our narratives they will never show the skyscrapers of south africa the beautiful buildings in nairobi kenya they will never show how beautiful kigali rwanda is or the beautiful streets of kingston jamaica they will never show the beautiful expensive buildings on banana island lagos nigeria or the great developments going on in places like uganda ethiopia we must own our own narratives we must be color brave and not color blind be brave with your color we must pursue financial empowerment no society no nation will take a people serious if they are just drawers from the economy and not contributors we must get into other creative areas and not just be those who sing, who dance and play sports. We must stop seeking reparations, only demand respect. We must also stop seeking apologies, just respect. No apologies necessary, just respect. No apologies necessary, just respect. We need to get the criminal justice system reformed, a system that continues to put our people behind bars is unfair is unjust there are more young black gentlemen in prison in the united states of america than there are possibly in the universities we need to see a strong we need to see structural racism go away we need to beat that victim mentality stop we should stop carrying ourselves as victims of a race racing profile and demonstrate our ability by the things we achieve we need to stop the baby mama baby father scourge that is disenfranchising our community and making it look like the nucleus family cannot be built by the black person we need to don't reach a place where we don't drop the mic we speak up for our community but i end this talk by saying we need to own our narratives don't let everyone else speak for you without your voice being heard what's wrong with being black absolutely nothing what do we need just the respect and allowance for us to perform and show that what others can do, we can do too. There's absolutely nothing wrong with being black. Thank you. shade please make room for a beauty see i have learned so different kinds of hate so your words they can't break me down got that skin kissed by heaven's rays dripping in gold no you want a taste of this deep red soil this ancestral light stays blinding catch me rising in my black that's oh so beautiful oh my black is oh so beautiful oh her black is oh so beautiful oh his Black is oh so beautiful I know you see me in this darkest shade I got it all from my mama See she gave birth to kings and queens so great Passing wisdom through matter 
So it's time to tap into that consciousness Cause too many children are gone Laying in oceans unsung Dreams hanging from trees The way strange fruits once done Reparations better come So don't feel away When we ascend with no apology That Nubian energy Will have you shook Have you shook Cause our black is oh so beautiful Oh, our black is oh so beautiful. Oh, my black is oh so beautiful. Oh, his black is oh so beautiful. Yeah, say bye 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 to these haters, yeah. Cause they can't try finesse, we got melanin proud, you see. Bye 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 to these haters, yeah. Cause they can't try finesse, we got melanin proud, you see. Oh, my black is oh so beautiful. Oh, her black is oh so beautiful. Oh, his black is oh so beautiful. There's no mistake. Oh, our black is oh so beautiful. Thank you. This Bible reading is taken from the book of Psalms. Psalms 44 verses 24 to 26 and Psalms 13 verses 2 and 3 in the New International Version. Psalms 44 verses 24 to 26. Why do you hide your face and forget our misery and oppression? We are brought down to the dust. Our bodies cling to the ground. Rise up and help us. Rescue us because of your unfailing love. Psalms 13 verses 2 and 3. How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. A prayer for God's life-giving breath. Gracious and Holy One, creator of all things and all people, we come to you praying to share in your passion for justice. Justice that will fill our lungs with pure breath like the air on a mountaintop. As pilgrims in the desert below, we come seeking to preserve your life-giving breath. Rid us of gnawing dissatisfactions and anxious imaginings that take your breath away. Rid us of biases and prejudices that take your breath away. Gracious and Holy One, give us breath. We are your people of equal worth and value. Take away our fretful preoccupations and nagging preconceptions that take your breath away. Take away the need to judge and act according to race and ethnicity, which take your breath away. Gracious and Holy One, give us breath. You created us to love you, each other and your creation. We repent of old ways of thinking and the arrogance of being right that take your breath away. We repent that we have not been fair, just and equitable, that take your breath away. Gracious and Holy One, give us breath. Losing us from the grip of sin that binds and holds us captive. Losing us from injustice and being judged unjustly by others. Lord, without you, we cannot breathe. Loosen our institutions from the grip of institutional racism. 
loosen our nations and our leaders from habits that discriminate. Lord, without you, we cannot breathe. Loving God, hold us as merely held your son and breathe your life-giving spirit into us so that we may be lifted into the place where we are all your children. Fill our lungs with your overflowing and gracious breath so that we may continue on the road towards justice. We pray these for all people in every place in the name of your life-giving Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. This time last year, the world watched in horror as the news and pictures of the murder of George Floyd filled our news feeds. Tragically, this inhumane act of brutality was no isolated incident. Yet somehow this arrest, this death, this act of racial injustice on a street in Minneapolis became a pivotal moment for us all. Maybe it was something about the uncertainty and restrictions of a global pandemic that created a unique existential kind of stillness. A sort of stillness that meant that one man's words, barely audible, gasping, I can't breathe, reverberated with crystal clarity around the whole world. And that gasp was amplified, becoming like a megaphone as one man's urgent plea for life and breath unleashed a renewed cry, a renewed heart cry for justice right across the globe. A heart cry for breath and life and freedom, a heart-rending cry of enough, enough. But the truth is that this megaphone was not just expressing the heart cry of the oppressed in the face of injustice. This megaphone was also proclaiming the heart cry of God himself. The prophet Jeremiah writes, Let the one who boasts boast about this, that they have the understanding to know me, and that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice and righteousness on the earth. This is who God is, kind, just, righteous. This shows us God's heart, kind, just, righteous. So our compassionate, just and righteous God beheld this killing with horror too. He too jostles with the protesters as they clamour in the street shouting, enough, enough. He sits with and listens to the heart-rending lament of those that bear the heavy burden of racism every single day. This was a pivotal moment, becoming like a megaphone, proclaiming God's own heart cry for justice. But in that unique existential stillness, this murder was not only a megaphone, it was also a mirror as through the exponential potency of the media, the reverberations from the images, the words, the horror cascaded and flowed into my phone, onto my TV, into my home, into my church, bringing me and so many people of privilege like me face to face with the brutal and merciless realities of injustice. In the stillness of this global pandemic, there was no longer any place to hide, no distractions, not even the soundtrack of normal life to dull the senses to the experiences of others. Just stark, unavoidable reality, revealing the awful truth that somehow pervasive and relentless injustice had become some sort of grotesquely acceptable norm. In the death of George Floyd, God was holding up a mirror to me, to his church, to the whole world. And on that mirror is written, I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice and righteousness on earth, for in these things I delight. And as I come to know the Lord more deeply, as I read those words, for in these things I delight, I am heartbroken. And we should be heartbroken as we see and realise just how much some of us have conformed to the patterns of this world and failed to understand and know the God we worship. 
As we look steadily into the mirror that the Lord sets before us, we see that there is absolutely no place for passivity, naivety, ignorance or prejudice anymore. A new resolve is born in us, an unflinching determination that those of us who have privilege will stand in solidarity with those who are oppressed by injustice. A relentless commitment as church to putting our own house in order so that our hunger for God's coming kingdom might be so much stronger than the cultural norms that seek to shape us. A courageous dedication to be the towering beacons of hope and love and justice that God calls us to be and the world needs us to be. No longer inhabiting and perpetuating the status quo of unjust social, economic and institutional structures, but being the vanguard in our communities, prophets boldly declaring and embodying that God is a God of kindness, justice and righteousness and shaping ourselves and our communities and our world to reflect the values of his kingdom. A year on, the death of George Floyd remains a megaphone declaring the inhumanity of racism and injustice. A year on, God continues to hold up a mirror to his church and invites us to become people that delight his heart by sharing his kindness, his justice and his righteousness. We would like to use this moment in the service to remember the murder of George Floyd in the USA, as well as those who have lost their lives while in police custody and to racial violence in this country. As this takes place, the choir will sing, Walk With Me. I would like to invite the students from Archbishop Tennyson and St. Martin in the Field Secondary Schools in South London to lay candles at the foot of the cross. So many know that by my life, 
to invite four young people, Rodney Coker, Jane Mallett, Noah Reddy, and Phoebe Andre Watson to join us at the front for our minute silence. Can we all stand as we observe a minute silence to George Floyd and those who have lost their lives to intolerance? Thank you. Please be seated. And now, Shamara Fletcher, Principal Officer for Pentecostal, Charismatic, and Multicultural Relationships as Churches Together in England, will recite the poem for the love of my people. For the love of my people, I will study myself to discern who I have become. I will see how my mind has been influenced from the moment of my birth, for the love of my people. I will examine myself for the visible and the invisible scars of my past. I will see how I have learned to view myself with disdain. For the love of my people, I will open a book and read of my legacy as testified by the pens of my ancestors, sisters, and brothers, and spoken from the minds of those who have known. For the love of my people, I choose to recognize, respect, and utilize those gifts that the Creator has given to me 
so that I may excel in all that I do and all that I am, so that I may be in peace with myself for the love of my people. I will challenge myself, promise myself to change, to uncover the depth of the beautiful black woman that I am in all of her glory and with all of her dreams. For the love of my people, I will experience my life as the beautiful black creation that I am. Thank you. I'd like to welcome now Les Isaac, CEO of the Ascension Trust and the man responsible for the Street Pastors Initiative in Britain and Ireland to give the address. Thank you. Doing justice. I really like that title, Doing Justice. And so often in, in the imperfect world, in a world full of injustice, there's justice for some and injustice for others. The killing of George Floyd was projected on a global stage. It gave a panoramic view of the challenges that black people and people from all over the world that they are facing in terms of injustice within the 21st century. The killing of George Floyd was not an isolated incident. For black people in America or for many people across the globe. Over the years, hundreds Thousands of black men and women, millions of people around the globe have been displaced and killed with impunity by the perpetrators. The Sunday after of the week that George Floyd was killed, and it was visualized and focused on our TV, I remember I was in church and the pastor asked an eight-year-old to pray. We're on a social media platform and this woman, woman began to bawl, as we would say. She was lamenting. I could see that the pastor was feeling a little bit uncomfortable because this went on for at least 10 minutes. And my thoughts was, create the space for her to weep. And as we were saying, the Caribbean to ball. She was crying. She was crying and she was crying. On the Tuesday night, we have our Bible studies. And I rang the pastor the, in the early afternoon. I said, could we create some space for the people just to speak? And we talked about it. She welcomed the congregation on the platform and she said, we're going to be studying the scripture. We'll be looking at the return of Jesus. But before we do that, I'm going to create the space for us to talk. You can imagine, there was no Bible study that evening. But the eight-year-old woman said this, I am now 80 and from from the time I was a child up until now, there has been racism and injustice. She was crying because of her pain of so many years and the fact that she was still hoping for justice. Another woman in her 80s began to cry and began to talk. My son was killed in a police cell and I'm still looking for justice. The killing of George Floyd provoked anger, provoked pain, provoked a desire and a hope for justice. 
all that is necessary for evil to triumph is for good men and women to do nothing, doing justice. There's a cry for us to do justice. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. says this, ultimately the tragedy is not the oppression or the cruelty by bad people, but the silence of the good people. It would appear that we have lost our sense of anger and outrage. But somehow we've also lost our capacity for compassion and for lament about the injustices that are taking place around the world in so many nations. And there is a sense that we have chosen to be silent over the injustices that we can see all around us. Some Christians has, have adopted the theology, let's wait until we reach heaven. Let's wait until we meet Jesus, for then justice will take place. Well, I want to remind us, Jesus said, I came to set the captive free to open the prison door and to declare the acceptable year of the Lord. I love that story in the gospel. When Jesus went to Nazareth, his hometown, and he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and they brought the scroll to him and he began to read the scriptures. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and the recovery of sight to the blind. And listen to this. And to set the oppressed free. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. We cannot, we must not continue and to hide under the cloak of blindness with all the global cameras and information that we have access to informing us every day of the injustice that is happening on our doorsteps and around the world. It cannot be business as usual for the church, society, nations, and the world. Silence in the face of evil itself is evil. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. I want to remind us that the kingdom of Jesus is about the whole person. I have come, Jesus says, that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. That's the message of Jesus. That's the message of the kingdom of God. That includes justice, that includes peace, that includes equality, that includes dignity. But it also includes salvation and hope and forgiveness of sin and eternal life. As a Christian, I'm called not just to pray, but I'm called to action. Faith without works is dead. Justice means that we have to stand up, but equally, we have to stand out. And equally, we need to speak out. Our faith in our Christianity is dead if it's not practical, if it's not relevant, and if it does not speak up and speak out for justice. I'm for doing justice, and I believe wholeheartedly the church is for doing justice. And so I pray today, as we continue to reflect on this day, that all of us will say, I'm for justice, and I'm going to take my stand to declare that justice is here for everyone. Thank you.
Would you welcome one of our leading gospel artists, Davinia Robinson, who will now come and encourage the family and all those who are struggling and suffering with that wonderful song, Encourage Yourself. Oh, yeah. 
take over yourself encourage yourself in the Lord reading from Luke's Gospel, chapter 18, beginning to read at the first verse. Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, grant me justice against my opponent. For a while he refused, but later he said to himself, though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice, so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says, and will not God grant justice? to his chosen ones who cry to him by day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? To have justice, you have to call out injustice. As Christians, we are tasked by our Lord Jesus Christ to love one another as we would love ourselves. And that means loving everyone, friend and stranger alike, embracing diversity, welcoming all people and all cultures, loving our neighbours, all of them, not just the ones who look like and think like us, we're all one in Christ. That's a term used and often heard in Christian circles, that we're all one in Christ. Which is truly meaningful if actually it does mean that we are all one in Christ. Not we're all one in Christ except you, because you don't look or think like us. Christ embraced people, welcomed with open arms those on the margins of society. For the kingdom of God is for all of us. God's love is unconditional and is inclusive and is for all of us if we want to reach out and make that connection with Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Christ called out injustice. He spoke up for people. He spoke up for people who were treated unjustly against the authorities at that time. He saw injustice and he spoke out and he called it where he saw it. So often I hear, but Mandy, do you know what? All lives matter. And you know what? Of course all lives matter. But they don't matter and they can't matter while people turn a blind eye to injustice and inequalities and don't see the inequalities that people face and the injustice that people face day in and day out in our communities that leave them excluded, isolated, suffering and without a sense of belonging. As a child, how often did you say, that's not fair? Why have they go? How come I'm not allowed? Or whatever it was. Because whether a child, a young adult, an older adult, we all want to be treated fairly. We all want to be treated justly, don't we? We want to be assured that in today's society that you, me, your child, my child are treated fairly and have equal access to services, to education, to healthcare, to housing, to our justice system. But when people see others being treated unfairly, ignored when asking for help, passed over because of the colour of their skin, abused because they're perceived to be different, 
Of course, people get annoyed, they get disheartened, they get disillusioned, and they disconnect from, in many cases, a system that doesn't consider them or their needs. And that's not about being selfish. That's about understanding we're all different and we all have different needs. Might be about accessibility, might be about our culture. For we are and we live in a multicultural society. And as such, in our faith, we have to embrace this and work in our communities and in our sphere of influence to uphold this. As we navigate our way through the injustice of racism, let's take time to listen, to explain, to educate ourselves and others, to make a difference and to do all this so we can make a difference, so we can understand how people feel. So we can, like Jesus, take a stand against injustice and inequality and be advocates for those in our community who are not being treated fairly. For Jesus calls us to love our neighbour. And loving our neighbour means reaching out to them and helping them when they're in need and standing beside them when they've been treated unfairly and speaking out for them so that they know that they belong and that in God's kingdom, everyone is treated fairly and justly. Let us all stand again as the choir leads us in what promises to be a rousing rendition of the great hymn, Guide Me, O Our Great Jehovah. And now we will hear the Lord's Prayer.
Ein tad or an wit and a never. Who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Is there balm to heal the hurt and pain of racial injustice? There is a balm to heal the hurt and pain of racial injustice. I have called my church to bear witness through its love for one another. I have called my church to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly before me. I have called my church to model equity and equality. In Christ there are no chosen ones, and those who are cast aside there are no privileged or underprivileged. There is no male or female. We are all one in him. Lord Jesus, we are sorry that we have not been faithful witnesses. Merciful God, we are sorry that our example falls so short of your commands. Holy Spirit, help your church to set the right example for this generation and the generations to come. There is a balm for you and me. Is there balm to mend the wounds and scars of racially motivated violence? There is a balm to mend the wounds and scars of racially motivated silence. Crucified Christ, you were beaten, ridiculed, pierced, and suffered grave indignities. Expose the wicked deeds and the plans of the perpetrators of injustice. Pour your oil of gladness upon the wound and upon all those who suffer scars of racism and prejudice. Be their helper, their source of strength, and their voice of courage that may might not be silent or silenced. Sovereign Lord, let justice roll down like a river and righteousness like an overflowing stream. In speech, in action, in decision making, in times of disappointment and struggle, may your church and leaders of every kind pursue justice and justice alone. There is a balm for you and for me. Is there balm to heal the sin sick souls of racist perpetrators, hostile environments, and institutional racism? There is a balm to heal the sin-sick souls of racists, violent perpetrators, hostile environments, and institutional racism. The kingdom of God is not the utterance of politically correct words, insincere actions, and prejudice. 
It is a kingdom of power, of love, and of mercy. It is a kingdom where every tribe, every ethnicity, every nation, every language is listened to, is heard, is valued, and understood. It is the kingdom of communion, the sitting at the same table, the sharing of drink, and the eating of food. It is a welcoming table of the beloved, the anti-racist, the reconcilers, and those who seek justice. There is a balm for you and me. Is there a balm to heal the weary, the vulnerable, the disenfranchised, the undeserved, the left out, and the left behind? There is a balm to heal the weary, the vulnerable, the disenfranchised, the undeserved, the left out, and the left behind. The Spirit of the Lord says, Come, come you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Come you who are hungry, I am the bread of life. Come you who are lonely, and I will console and comfort you. Come, 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 there is a balm for you and me. I am persuaded that there's a balm to heal the hurt and pain of racial injustice. There's a balm to mend the wounds and scars of racially motivated violence. There is a balm to heal the sin-sick souls of racist, violent perpetrators, hostile environments, and institutional racism. There is a balm to heal the weary, the vulnerable, the disenfranchised, the undeserved, the left out, and the left behind. Doing justice is a balm for you and me. Can I now invite you all to stand for the blessing which will be given to us by the Right Reverend Christopher Chisholm, the Bishop of Southwark. May God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the source of all goodness and growth, pour his blessings upon all things created and upon you, his beloved children, that you may use his gifts to his glory and the welfare of all peoples. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and those you love this day and always. Amen. Amen.